So good afternoon. Thank you all for coming today. My name is Michael Rosen, and I am a visiting fellow at AEI's Center for Internet Communications and Technology Policy. And on behalf of the entire Tech Center, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for uh, attending and um, hopefully enjoying our panel on legislative patent reform. I was actually surprised this morning because uh, I, I do know this is a very controversial and heated debate going on right now, but um, it was surprising to see a whole bunch of protesters outside AEI this morning. It was just kind of shocking. And again, I know it's controversial, but I didn't understand the Halliburton signs and the blood for oil and what that had to do exactly with uh, patent reform. But then I figured out that it was actually Vice President Cheney speaking this morning here. So anyway, that's, uh, that's not us. But I am pleased that we actually got about half the crowd of the Vice President for this event. So uh, that's not too bad. So anyway, we will, uh, we are, we're going to jump right in with our panel. I just wanted to, to introduce them briefly with some very short remarks about the patent reform debate that's currently taking place. And you know, there are a lot of different ways to measure uh, and to track how this discussion is going on. Some people track the, the debate by just following uh, the different congressional sessions. This happened in this session, this happened in that session. Others track particular pieces of legislation, try to figure out how and when they make it out of committee or whether they make it out of committee. Others like to sort of follow how the interest groups are going along with these uh, with the different measures and who's saying what and who's protesting what. And others try to track the social media buzz that's generated by a piece of newly introduced legislation. But here at the Tech Center, we do things a little differently. And we track the nature of the patent reform debate by the number of panels that we host here at the Tech Center related to patent reform. And let me explain what I mean by that. We held our first panel on this topic in March of 2014, way back when, feels like a long time ago. And right around then, that was when the original Innovation Act was pending before the Senate. And when uh, Senators Schumer and Cornyn were in the middle of hammering out uh, the compromise that would later form sort of the core of the, the Senate, the current Senate bill, the Patent Act. Um, we then held our next panel some months later, 10 months later, in January 2015, earlier this year. And that was months after the various measures had perished in the Senate in the last Congress. And uh, just one day after Representatives Goodlatte and ISA had announced the, uh, the reintroduction of the Innovation Act. And now, nine months after that, sure enough, uh, we're proud to be hosting our third patent reform panel. And judging by the halting progress of the various measures currently in front of Congress, it's probably safe to say that in about another nine months, we'll be here, or maybe on Capitol Hill, hosting our fourth panel on the topic. So again, this is how we track how things are going on um, by the, the number of panels that we hold and the space between them and, and where things are at every, uh, at every moment in time. So, no one knows exactly where things are going, but the people seated here on the dais uh, have a, a really well-informed sense, actually, of, of how things are shaking out on the Hill and where they're going to be uh, in the coming session as Congress returns. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our panel of very distinguished experts on this topic. Here at AEI and at the Tech Center, we strive to present a balance and a variety of viewpoints and perspectives on the issue, as well as a variety of people from different technology fields, people in industry, lawyers, lobbyists, et cetera. We try to bring an, an inside the beltway and an outside the beltway approach to the problem. And here with our, with our group of panelists, this is really no exception. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to read the full biographies of each panelist, um, but you have that on your literature in front of you. Instead, uh, I will just give a brief introduction to all of them. And here they are in alphabetical order. Please hold your applause until I finish reading all of them. So first, uh, we're joined by Mike Godwin, who's the Director of Innovation Policy and the General Counsel at the R Street Institute. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Next, we have Paul Hastings, the CEO and chairman of Oncomed Pharmaceuticals. Welcome, welcome, Paul. Uh, number three, Philip Johnson, the senior vice president for intellectual property policy and strategy at Johnson & Johnson. Glad you could be here, Phil. 
Uh, number four, we have Matt Levy, the Patent Counsel for the Computer and Communications Industry Association. Uh, he's also the lead blogger for Patent Progress. Thanks for being here, Matt. Next, we have Lori Self, the Vice President and Counsel for Qualcomm. Thanks for joining us, Lori. And last but not least, we have Robert Taylor, uh, the owner of RPT Legal Strategies uh, and also a spokesman for the National Venture Capital Association. So a nice round of applause for our panelists. So in the interest of time, we're going to uh, dispense with opening statements from each panelist. Otherwise, we'd probably use up all our time with that. And we're going to jump in with a series of questions that I'm going to uh, hopefully help guide us through um, and get a range of different opinions on all of them. So what we're going to start with is just a very basic try, trying to reach a very basic understanding of what the nature of the problem is that Congress is trying to solve. How do we define the problem? And what is it exactly? So we'll start with uh, sort of the first sub-question of how serious a problem is patent abuse or abuse of the patent system? And I'm going to let Matt take the first whack at that one, followed by Lori. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so <clears throat> I suppose the easy answer is that patent abuse is a real problem. Uh, the problem is that the best way I've heard it explained is what we have really is an arbitrage situation. The patent litigation is now so expensive that a patent owner has the ability to sue someone for patent infringement and request a settlement that's substantially less than the cost of defending the suit, which really encourages a, an accused infringer to settle whether or not they've done anything wrong simply because of the costs. So that makes it somewhat profitable simply to sue people for patent infringement, whether or not your patent is legitimately infringed, which is not really the purpose of patents. Uh, the data is showing that lawsuits are up. There was a little blip down last year, but they're certainly back up. Uh, the majority of patent suits are now filed by uh, patent assertion entities or patent trolls, depending on the, the name. I usually like patent trolls because it's, um, well, it's more fun to say. Um, and it drives people like Lori nuts. But the, um, you know, the, the fact is it's very profitable, and as long as it's profitable, we're going to keep seeing it. The, the patent system obviously has some crucial value for many industries, for example, the pharmaceutical industry, for companies like Qualcomm that, make, that, that you know, have designed some fundamental technologies. But at the same time, we have a, a large group that's simply using them to extract money from companies that are actually doing things. So the, the conversation around abuse, um, I mean, first of all, abuse exists in any system. It's almost a rhetorical question, does abuse exist? Yes, of course it does. I think, though, going back to some of the points that Matt was making about data, I think it's really important to understand, you know, to what extent are we seeing patterns of abuse that are anomalous or aberrations or suggest that there is a kind of upward trend of abusive litigation relative to other points in history. And so if you look at the patent system over the past you know, 225 years or so, um, historically, patent litigation rates have remained largely constant at about 1 to 2 percent per year, meaning that if you, took it, like, if you look at the aggregate number of patents in the system, about 1 to 2 percent will actually result in litigation of any kind. And the very robust scientific studies that have been done recently indicate that we're, we, we are not seeing a, a deviation from that trend, that, his, that the average rate of patent litigation is, is still remaining within that historical uh, pattern. Now, are we seeing periodic upticks in litigation? Yes, post AIA, the American Vents Act, you saw a temporary spike in litigation that empiricists attribute to um, the new joinder rules that require a patent owner when you're suing multiple defendants, whereas pre-AIA you could sue one suit combining or joining multiple defendants. Now you have to sue multiple defendants via multiple actions. And so the most recent you know, uh, increase that we're seeing seems to be attributable to that same dynamic. Um, and then to Matt's point, last year we actually saw a temporary decline in litigation of about 
18%, which some attribute to the Supreme Court decisions that we're seeing coming out um, in, in recent years. So it's, it's very hard to glean anything meaningful from temporary increases or decreases in litigation. I think you really have to look at historical patterns. Now, that's not to suggest that abuse doesn't exist. And, and you know, we are very committed and have been very committed for quite some time to try to figure out how do you disincentivize abusive litigation without undermining the legitimate patent rights of the vast majority of inventors in this country who are good faith participants in the system and that drive so much of the economic growth that we see. And I think the frustration that companies like Qualcomm have is that if you look at some of the legislative proposals that are being tabled, they really aren't about abusive conduct or abusive actors. They really undermine the value of all patents. And so I think it's important to talk about abuse, but it's also, I think it's important to recognize that this conversation around abuse has become a rhetorical political justification for sweeping changes that would impact all patent owners. Thanks, Lori. And any other panelists care to talk about this point? Or maybe we'll, um, I, I, yeah. Oh, Phil, go ahead. Well, you have to put the, you have to put the abuse in. Thank you. You have to put it in context. Um, for our company, we have some people who are making allegations that we don't against us that we don't think are well founded, but far fewer in the patent area as a percentage or any other measure than in uh, some of the tort claims areas. You have you all see the TV ads where people are advertising if you have taken you name the product if you've taken any drug. Um, if you take a, a blood thinner, we have a blood thinner, and you've had bleeding, then you should join a lawsuit. And there are thousands and thousands of these. And are they brought using the same criteria frequently with the idea that they would be settled out for less than the cost of going through a full litigation? Absolutely. And in fact, they are. So the patent system uses the litigation system. The litigation system is inherently expensive for everyone that's involved in it. And unfortunately, that creates the opportunity for some abuse by people who may bring cases that really are not meritorious and may be seen as abusing the system. But it is a cost that in other areas of litigation we bear because of the basic fundamental uh, and constitutional requirements that the public have access to the courts and that they need to be able to petition to redress wrongs. Thanks, Phil. Matt, you want to have the last word on this one? Yeah. Uh, Phil, it's, uh, I find it funny that you mention um, you know, the tort lawyers because the Eastern District of Texas, as many of you know, uh, is the hotbed for um, patent troll litigation. That's where many patent assertion entities file their claims. And as the story goes, part of the reason was that um, Texas passed tort reform, which left these lawyers who file those sorts of product liability and personal injury cases without a profitable industry, and they turned to patent infringement cases. So they're filing for patent trolls. Uh, but sort of to Lori's point you know, about statistics and there only being 1% to 2% of patents litigated, that's actually sort of a misleading statistic, because what you have to look at is how many cases are being filed just for the purposes of monetization. In other words, they're not being filed by competitors. They're not being filed by the original designers of the technology who are going after people who are using it but you know, didn't license. Uh, and it's a majority. A number of studies have consistently found that it's a majority of cases now, which it never was. I mean, this is a relatively new phenomenon that started uh, about in the last 20 years, and we're now up to a majority of patent litigation being used just to make money. Can I, can I have the last, last word? Sure, you can have the last, last word, Lori. EPS? It's only fair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, again, this notion that so-called non-practicing entities or patent assertion entities are new to the system is, is not the case. If, if you look that, at... That's if, not what I said. Well, first of all, the notion of a non-practicing entity or patent... Patent assertion entity 
has existed since the beginning of our patent system. It is a design feature of the patent system, if you will, this notion that an independent individual inventor can own a property right, assert that property right, sell that property right to a third party who can then in turn assert a pop that right. That was a you know intentional design feature of our patent system anticipated by our founding fathers and really viewed as um, a, a means to incentivize economic investment and growth through research and development. Now, you know, to Matt's point, is there, are, are we seeing a majority of abusive actors now bringing suit? Again, it define, it depends how you define this so-called category of, of, you know, troll. And a lot of the, the studies that have kind of fueled this, you know, notion that there is a troll-driven crisis use very broad definitions of so-called trolls that sweep in you know, a, a large number of independent inventors, universities, research institutions, et cetera. So I, I just, I think it's, it's it, 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 you know, data can be man manipulated, characterized in lots of different ways to support a um, thesis of one kind or another or to support an agenda of one kind of, or another. So I think we have to be very, um, you know, careful about the terminology and careful about the, the data that we're, uh, citing as evidence of, of the problem. So, so that's a great um, segue, actually, Lori, for my next question, which is how would you on the panel define the term patent troll, number one? Number two, is it useful to, to do so? So I want to start with Mike, and then we'll turn to Bob. Hi. Um, so I'm glad, I'm so glad that you assigned me this question, uh, because I just hate the term patent troll. I just hate it because I think it it creates uh, more, it generates more heat than light. Uh, and one of the reasons that I support uh, 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 patent litigation reform of the kind that we're seeing uh, in both houses of Congress is that it doesn't really try to say that there's such a thing as abusive cases or non-abusive cases. What I think, it, what I think this, these efforts do is this. Uh, I think they certainly address the issue of people who are using patent litigation uh, strategically, which, which Matt has, has discussed. But I also think that uh, there is a very strong effort uh, in, in the legislation, at least as I read it, uh, to address you know, what Lori is concerned about, which is making sure that whatever reforms we put in place don't undermine the merits of the patent system. And as I read the, 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 the bills, what I'm seeing is uh, 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 an effort not to decide who's a troll or who's abusive or not and sort of cast that, uh, 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 that nomenclature into law. What I see instead is a recognition that patent litigation is among the most complicated kind of litigation that we do. If you don't believe me, try reading patent prosecutions and patent cases. They're hard. They're so hard that even if you're a judge who's experienced with dealing with patent cases, as some judges in the Eastern District of Texas are, uh, a new case may be totally different. And it may not help you to have construed patent claims in a previous case to have to do them in a new case involving a fundamentally different different type of claim. So if you think that, uh, if you recognize that uh, litigation costs are, are inherently uh, at least at risk of being quite high, and you know that these cases are difficult, you try to reach uh, a sort of procedural fixes that make the cases easier for our courts to handle. And none of this involves, you know, uh, denying anyone a right, to, uh, their constitutional right to uh, to prosecute or defend or uh, assert a patent claim. Uh, none of that, uh, you know, everybody still gets access to the federal courts, but the idea of having a procedural fix that allows, or a set of procedural fixes that, number one, allow uh, construction of the patent claim early on uh, before there's a lot of expensive discovery because discovery is a cash register, an open cash register for litigation lawyers. Um, if you, limit, if you limit discovery and you reach the substantive issues early, you've done a lot to make uh, patent litigation both easier to start if you're a claimant, easier to start if you're a patent claimant, but also easier to defend if you're a patent defendant. 
And that's why I like it. I actually think this benefits, this is not uh, reform legislation that benefits big guys versus little guys or little guys versus big guys. I think everyone with a meritorious claim should be happy that the discovery process is being addressed. Uh, so, so that's sort of where I would start out. Uh, there is some stuff in, in, in uh, uh, the, there are differing stuff in the House and Senate bills about fee shifting. I think that fee shifting uh, is okay. It's okay to have a, a, a good rule for fee shifting in patents. We, we can decide what that rule is. But I think that uh, if you disincentivize people from bringing uh, uh, frivolous claims, then you've done a lot that's good. So meritorious claims presumably survive and, and, and get fees awarded in the appropriate places. Yes, Mike. Bob? Yeah. Where I disagree with what Mike just said, well, let me start in a different place. Uh, the, the word troll is a wonderful marketing tool <laughs> and has been the marketing tool for the two uh, principal patent reform bills working their way through Congress uh, from the outset. Anytime you can label something, you can stop thinking about it, and other people can stop thinking about it. But when you ask the question, what is a troll, you can't get an answer from anyone. And the reason you can't get an answer is because an entity that owns a U.S. patent has a property right. Uh, it's often a small company, although in some cases these are pretty substantial organizations. Uh, it has a right, it goes into court seeking to enforce its property right because the person that it's, that it's suing uh, refuses to take a license from, uh, with respect to that property right. And those companies look a lot like uh, other companies that everyone would acknowledge is a viable and important part of the U.S. economy. The venture capital world uh, uh, covers literally thousands of small companies uh, that start with uh, $100,000 worth of investor capital uh, all the way up to multiple millions of dollars worth of investor capital. Many of those companies uh, need patents. Many of those companies do not need patents. The VC world has been as afflicted by abusive patent litigation as, uh, as some of the larger uh, uh, parts of, our, of American industry. Uh, but it also uh, relies heavily in some of its segments, in some industries, it relies heavily on patents. Mike said that this is not, that the pending bills are not a large company versus small company issue. Uh, anyone interested in looking at that should read my statement uh, before the House Judiciary Committee last February, because that was the primary concern that the, that the National Venture Capital Association asserted is the, the, the provisions of those bills would make it much more difficult for a small company to assert a patent than for a large company. So what, what, the way we viewed the, the bills is narrowing, increasing the cost for all litigants, but, but when you think about increasing the cost uh, to uh, someone like Johnson & Johnson, for example, Phil, um, versus a, a startup that has maybe $3 million worth of investor capital in the bank, and it needs to go to court to deal with a, an eight, six, six to $10 million lawsuit, uh, that's a very significant disparity. And, and that's the major problem that, that, that uh, the VC world has had with this legislation. It deprives the courts of discretion to deal on a case-by-case -case basis with uh, the, the problems that come up in patent litigation, and it does it to the detriment of small companies. Okay. Thanks, Bob. I just want to interrupt briefly to, uh, for a brief uh, commercial note. If you're tweeting this event, we urge you, encourage you to use the hashtag patents114. So that's a word from our sponsor. Thank you. Um, all right, so in terms of, of abuse, there's recently been some more controversy of, a, of a, an alleged abuse from a very different side, uh, and that would be 
the the issues of uh, interparties review abuse, and we're starting to see hedge funds filing IPRs in particular against pharmaceutical drugs. So I'd like to see uh, if Paul and Phil can address this issue. Is this a form of abuse? Um, do, do you regard it that way? Is this a problem or is this just sort of also a feature, not a bug of the system? Actually, it's the creation of a new patent troll called the hedge fund manager. Um, so one of the things I find interesting about this whole debate is that it, it basically, when you try to fix an area for one industry, it pops up in the other as a problem. So those very people that are using the system to extract money from one industry, when you try to fix that issue, gets transferred to another industry. So when we try to fix the patent system and we have IPR, and we have these folks like these hedge funds out there, they become patent trolls for us, and their immediate goal is for immediate financial gain. What they actually do, and there are a number of lawsuits, uh, a number of our IPR cases out there right now in our industry, and they're growing by leaps and bounds. And what these hedge fund managers do is they basically short the stock while simultaneously filing an IPR. Why? Well, I'll give you a little bit of brief history about my company. I started at my company when there were 12 employees, a few patents, and $3 million. We now have seven drugs in the clinic and 18 clinical trials, have raised $650 million, and we have about 4,000 patents. And if I had to defend all of them from a hedge fund manager who just decided, well, maybe your platform isn't exactly what I would like it to be. There's a lower standard for me to challenge these, so I'm just going to throw that out there create a lot of noise in the marketplace, short your stock, make a lot of financial gain, and you know, what's, what about you? Well, I don't really care. Uh, and that has now transferred from the hedge fund manager to other smart people, other innovators who are you know, uh, now understanding that if they file an IPR, it's gonna cripple a 100-person company like Oncomed or a 50-person company uh, in the biotechnology space. So these are our uh, definition of patent trolls. Thanks, Paul. Phil? Sure. Um, the Patent Office, the American Vents Act, which was passed a few years ago, established new proceedings in the Patent Office, which for the first time would allow any member of the public to challenge patents for the life of the patent based on prior patents and publications with the idea that it would be a cheaper, quicker procedure to get to the bottom of whether the patent was valid or not. The intention of the American Invents Act was laudable, but as implemented, they have turned out to be strongly skewed towards people challenging the patents, who, by the way, are the only ones who could choose to institute them. So the patent office and its uh, uh, implementation of this, set them up so that uh, there would be a very favorable set of rules that would apply to these challenges. And I'll give you um, a couple of examples. The person who wants a challenge has to file a petition. They can attach declarations from experts and any evidence they want to the petition. But under the Patent Office rules, although the patent owner is given a chance to file a paper in reply, the patent owner cannot file any evidence in reply. If they have rebuttal evidence, if they have test data, if they have anything else, forget it. You can't put it in. All they're allowed to do is criticize the petition to see whether there are points in the petition that they disagree with. And then that a board at, at the moment, a board of three administrative law judges, decide whether or not to institute the proceeding, which they do over 75% of the time. And then that same board, when you show up in court, it's not actually in court because they do everything in writing, there's no live testimony, but when you show up with your evidence to be considered, who do you see? You see the same three judges who just wrote an extensive opinion against you as to why you should have lost, why your patent should be invalid. And lo and behold, the statistics vary based on how you cut it, but they range between 8 and 16% of the patents survive and the rest of them are invalidated. That is a wildly different outcome than what you would see in federal court for validity challenges. 
if we're in the pharma, biopharma space, the number, the success rate is as high as 60% for validity. So you have a hugely different uh, difference in outcome, which is why you have hedge funds leveraging this, because people can challenge patents in court then and now, and when they do, stock doesn't drop and people aren't shorting it because there's a public faith in the, in the uh, unbiased nature of federal litigation in court. The per perception, and it's, you, there will be arguments about whether it's reality, but the perception uh, reinforced by people like the chief judge of the patent board himself is that these are death squads that the patent office has set up to kill patents. In fact, the chief judge said if uh, the patent office wasn't, if the board wasn't doing some death squatting, it wouldn't be doing the job that Congress gave it. So with that perception, which is widely seen in the investor community, it presents the opportunity to play on the perception by filing one of these with the expectation that investors will figure that the filing equates to an invalidity ruling and that the stock will go down. So what's the solution? I don't think the solution is to get rid of these proceedings. I think the solution is to address the individual rules that are leading to the perception that they're not fair. And that is, in fact, what some of the bills in Congress are trying to do, especially the Senate version of the bill, which would require things like interpreting the patent claims to be of the same scope in the patent office as they would be considered in court. <coughs> By doing things like allowing the introduction of like-kind evidence. So when one paper is filed by the challenger, the patent owner can file similar evidence to get it out, to have it be heard. And other suggestions which are in um, some in the House bill, more in the Senate bill, intended to try to create fairness in the proceedings with the idea that if the patents are bad, bad patents will go down in fair proceedings. And if the patents are good, in fair proceedings, they'll be sustained. But rightly or wrongly, we have that perception that they're not fair, and we have it actually a downturn in the number of patents now being filed, in part because of a growing loss of confidence by some people in the patent system. Thanks, Phil. Matt, you want to give a quick response to that? Yeah. Um, you don't agree? Okay. I, I don't, on. largely because most of that was. We're sitting, sitting next to each other. I know. Um, so I'll be nice and, and not use the words that I would normally used to describe what you just said. But so let's, no, but seriously, let's talk about this, the death squad thing. There's a simple reason why so many patents actually get invalidated, which is not mentioned. Uh, if you file a petition and it's granted and the, peti and the patent is found to be valid, the challenger just lost their right to challenge again. They're stopped from making another challenge in court. They can't, any grounds that they could have raised or did raise, they're done. They can't do it anymore. So you would expect that the only petitions they file are for ones that they really think they're going to win. It's self-selecting. You would expect that most of them should win, right? Why would you file a crappy petition and throw away your chance to challenge it again? You're going to file a good one. So it's really not surprising that so many of them get through. Another thing is that I have yet to hear an opponent of the current IPR proceedings point out a single case where the PTAP got it wrong. And you know, not just, oh, I, I disagree because it was my patent, but you know, any reasonable person would look at that and go, man, that's just off. The Federal Circuit has affirmed them almost every time, one slight disagreement over claim construction, which got remanded back. The fact is they're doing a great job, and there's no proof that they're not. Um, as far as the rebuttal evidence thing that Phil said, actually, that's a real problem, which is why the PTO is revising the rules and already proposed rules to allow rebuttal evidence to be put in. So there's just no need for Congress to step in. The IPR proceedings are working quite well. I will say also the pharmaceutical industry, um, I don't know if you know what orange book patents are. Those are the, the critical patents on products that are approved by the FDA. Those, some, a number of those have been challenged so far. Zero have been invalidated, even though there are a number of decisions. Um, a lot of petitions have been denied. The first three, Kyle Bass petitions, who's the hedge fund uh, troll, 
His first three so far that have been reviewed, de denied. They're not looking good. He filed about 20 petitions so far. I don't know about leaps and bounds, but anyway, it was a lot to try and cram in there. I apologize, but you may can I, read more about it at Patent Progress. May I? Yeah, Paul That's because they get settled um, because people don't want to go through the expensive process. There's a burden of proof in the IPR system that's lower than the burden of proof in, in the circuit court system. And why would you not be able to attack a company when the burden of proof is lower and have a very good chance of, of having an outcome where that company would then turn around and either try to settle so they wouldn't have to go through this uh, procedure or uh, hope and pray that the rules get changed so that the burden of proof is equal across both systems. And by the way, where did it happen that they came out with a ruling where it shouldn't be the same? How can, how, you're setting up a system that's creating an imbalance so that anybody that wants to be a patent troll, I know you hate that word, can be. I love because it. Because they can, who hate them? I hate they it. Can, they can choose which way they want to, to manipulate however they want to, the system, uh, in, a, in a way that, that's going to have the greatest benefit for themselves. And so that puts a burden on, on everybody. So let's, let's come back to the, the IPR issue momentarily. I, just generally, I'd like to now turn to solutions or improvements that we can make to the, to the patent system in general. I don't get a rebuttal in the patent office, and I don't get one here either. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get. You'll, how about if you reserve your rebuttal for when we talk specifically about how we can fix the the IPR system? Is that is that fair, counsel? <laughs> All right, exactly. Um, but let's let's turn to first. Let's run through some specific issues, specific proposals that are before Congress now, um, because they're being debated. Let's actually talk about them. Attorney fees. What would you do, if anything, to change the current way that attorney fees are awarded, um, whether to shift the burden, to shift the presumption from one side to the other, to lower the burden? Um, so for this, let's, let's start with Lori, and then we'll go to Matt. So, I, let me just, oh, sorry. so if I had been asked the question on attorney's fees uh, and fee shifting specifically in 2013, my answer might have been somewhat different. At that time, uh, the Federal Circuit had established um, a very high bar for the exceptional cases standard that exists in our patent laws, the standard that has to be met um, by the um, prevailing party in order to justify an award of attorney's fees. And I think we viewed uh, the way that standard had been interpreted by the Federal Circuit as creating too high of a bar uh, in 2013. Um, since that time, the, federal, uh, the Supreme Court, rather, has uh, stepped in in a very significant way. And again, this is a pattern we've seen over the past decade where problems have been uh, identified to Congress and the courts step in to try to resolve those problems uh, in a manner to obviate the need for, for legislation. I think that is the case with respect to fee shifting. So the, the Supreme Court stepped in in two cases, one octane fitness, that significantly, essentially rejected the Federal Circuit's uh, interpretation of the exceptional case standard and in its place um, created a kind of totality of the circumstances standard, which effectively, I mean, from my perspective, it's kind of a non-standard standard. It gives courts very broad discretion latitude to decide whether the facts merit an award of attorney's fees. Uh, the other change that took place for the Supreme Court was um, lowering the burden of proof from a clear and convincing standard to a preponderance standard. So again, going back to the comments that were made about, um, you know, the kind, the the the, the uh, kind of evidence, uh, the um, quantity of evidence, if you will, that has to be put forward to to justify a particular um, legal position. So that's all, you know, fine and good from a theoretical point of view, but. I, I th but if you look at the data, I think it really does bear out the view that we are seeing a very significant um, shift in how the extent to which courts are awarding attorneys fees because of uh, the Supreme Court jurisprudence. And the Federal Circuit Bar Association put out a study um, a few months ago that basically showed, I think, that the number of um, cases uh, in which attorney's fees have been sought has something like quadrupled um, since the Supreme Court decision. And courts are awarding uh, attorney's fees in cases in which they're sought around 50% of the time. 
that is a very significant increase um, over recent years. And so if nothing else, I think it shows that we are in a period of significant change as a result of how um, courts are interpreting the Supreme Court jurisprudence in this area. And I think there is some merit in letting the cases evolve um, to see whether additional legislation is warranted. You know, for Qualcomm, um, you know, we are a big company. We are a defendant in all of our companies. Certainly, we would benefit from a fee-shifting regime that made it much easier for us to recoup our attorney's fees as a defendant. Um, but we're very worried about legislation that moves the pendulum too far in the other direction and, and really creates a dynamic where um, fee shifting becomes almost um, you know, mandatory or um, presumptive. And so, and, and again, really thinking about how would that type of regime impact smaller innovators, startups, um, universities, and the like. Well. So first, I want to be clear that I'm speaking just for myself here. Uh, this is my opinion. And I, I think I'm going to surprise Lori by saying I basically agree with her as far as the burden goes. I think Octane Fitness clearly emboldened a lot of uh, parties to go ahead and file motions for fees that they wouldn't have filed before under the old standard. It does seem to be evolving, and there are more awards than there used to be. Uh, my concerns are twofold, uh, just a couple things that Lori didn't talk about. One is making sure that the attorney's fee awards actually covers more than just uh, attorney's fees and basic costs, that it also includes the cost of discovery where appropriate. Because as Mike mentioned, discovery is where the money is. So if you can get your attorney's fees, well, you know, for a lot of firms that may be substantial, although frequently judges will reduce that, um, those discovery costs can be enormous. And uh, I think including those in the award actually adds some additional deterrence to those potential frivolous suits without necessarily changing the burden. Uh, the other thing is to deal with judgment-proof plaintiffs, because we have seen uh, a not uncommon phenomenon of uh, patent assertion entities putting a, transferring a patent to essentially an empty company that has nothing but the patent. They sue, they push their, you know, they may push a case that's riskier than they normally would because the company has no assets. So even if they <coughs> lose an award of fees, there's nowhere to go for the money. There's nothing there except the patent. And, you know, they may not, care that much about that if they lose. So there does need to be some way of going after the actual parties in interest. Exactly how that is, that's sort of being played out. I don't know that the joinder solution is necessarily the, the most elegant solution. That's one that's proposed in the House. Um, the Senate is still sort of working on it. There was a, an interesting, we, we don't need to get into the weeds, but I think the basic function of being able to go after judgment-proof plaintiffs is really important. Yeah, from the standpoint of, of the venture capital world where we have companies of all sizes but, but for the most part much smaller than, than some of the uh, litigants they get into, in, into major patent battles with, uh, the fee shifting thing is, is uh, terribly important. It, it, the cost of a patent case runs from anywhere from $5 million to $25 million uh, and, and, and beyond that in some cases. Uh, for, for a large company uh, that, will, that will have a lot of patent litigation uh, and will win some and lose some, that all turns out to be first part of the cost of doing business and second turns out to be, uh, 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 will turn out to be a wash over time. For a small company having to deal with a patent case where it's looking at having to pay the fees of a defendant, for example, uh, that's infringing its technology and simply refusing to take a license because it can. And that's a form of abuse that the venture capital world has to deal with on a, on a very significant basis. Uh, for that small company, uh, the fee shifting proposal in both the, the House and Senate bill uh, could be the death of a company that needed to enforce its patents. And, and while it is, it is accurate that the Supreme Court's decision uh, in the Highmark and Octane decisions, in the Highmark and Octane cases, uh, uh, really did uh, 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 create an opportunity for both in, both sides to recover their fees. Uh, that's a that's a discretionary action by the judge. Uh, it's easy to read the proposed uh, uh, proposals for for fee shifting as requiring the judge to shift fees 
uh, after making some preliminary determinations, and they're binary. It's not shifting some of the fees. Uh, if you read the and and discuss with the people in in the the, the uh, staffs of the two houses, they intend a binary outcome, and and that's uh, from again from the standpoint of a small company, uh, can be a can be a death knell. I, I, I want to add uh, uh, at least my thoughts about this, which is that um, I think I I actually like the idea of, uh, and actually I have like a combination of, 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 of Robert's views and Matt's, uh, but, but I think that uh, if we go back to what Matt said earlier about people arbitraging the system uh, uh, because it's costly, I, I think that uh, various ways to disincentivize that are worth exploring, and fee shifting is one of them. Uh, but I, I think that it, it, what, what, what you look at when you look at both the House and the Senate bills holistically is more than one effort to try to contain litigation costs, more than one measure. And the idea that you can move, uh, that you can uh, control discovery costs, that you can narrow uh, uh, pleadings or put more rigorous pleadings requirements in place so as to get to the merits of the patent claim earlier and to contain litigation costs at that early phase, that's key. But I also think there have to be at least some risks for people who do decide to initiate a lawsuit. I mean, I think that there have to be, I think that the idea here is that um, whether you, uh, whether you have empower the court to discretionarily award fees or whether you have a mandatory binary outcome, the idea here is to make it uh, not a game that you can walk away from easily. If you're going to engage the court system to do this, you, you are taking a risk, and it really ought to be a real risk. Uh, so for small companies, I think that, um, you know, that, that certainly will be part of their calculations, whether they want to defend and whether they can recover the fees, and they know that if they lose, they'll lose, and they may, it may hurt the company. That's certainly true, uh, but I, I, there's no rule that somehow levels the playing field between big, highly capitalized companies and smaller ones. There's no rule that does that. I, I wish there were, but, but there isn't one. Bigger uh, uh, companies are always going to have certain advantages. Having said that, I think that the, my sense of the equities of it is that there ought to be some risks uh, 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 regarding the legal cost, including the cost of discovery, when you choose to take on a case as a patent plaintiff. Yeah, and, and I look. I I, th I agree in concept with what you're saying, and I and I think the Supreme Court's decision does significantly increase that risk. And so the question is, are you know, do we now have a standard that creates appropriate risk, appropriate disincentives against abuse, appropriate discretion for courts, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a system that would be you know more like a mandatory binary binary system along the lines of of what uh, Bob described. And I think it's important to keep in mind that for small, smaller innovators, there is always a risk in pursuing litigation, particularly when you are suing a large defendant. You're actually taking the step of initiating a case. Um, you know, litigation is enorm enormously complicated, expensive, and it's when you're talking about patent cases, you can bring a patent case with the best uh, of intentions in all good faith, and you can still lose at the end of the day. And I think that's one of the reasons why our system has not historically moved to a mandatory system, because there is a recognition that you may believe that your patent is valid and infringed by the other party, and until you actually get into the litigation through discovery, et cetera, you don't really know whether you're right or wrong in that calculus. And the other thing to keep in mind, and I think it's an important thing to keep in mind, is when you talk about the role of litigation it really is to, it's a, it's a last resort, right? I mean, patents are not self-enforcing. Litigation is a last resort. But what you're hoping is that the litigation system creates the appropriate incentives on both sides. The appropriate incentives to, you know, not engage in abusive litigation as a patent owner, but the appropriate incentives as a potential user of a patented technology to come to the table, negotiate a license in good faith, and not force the patent owner to pursue litigation. And so when you move uh, something like attorney's fees standards from a discretionary totality of the circumstances type standard, which is what we now have today, to something that's mandatory or close to being mandatory, 
you significantly alter those incentives. And I think you create incentives for abuse on the other side for large defendants or, or large users of technology to basically say to the small innovator, fine, sue me. I can tie you up in knots. I can uh, play every game available uh, through the litigation system. And at the end of the day, you're going to run out of money and, you know, tough luck for you. So I think it's important to think, as we're thinking about these issues of, you know, risk and so forth, to think about um, the, the impact on both sides of the, uh, you know, innovator user divide. Thanks, Lori. Let's um, let's actually talk about venue for a moment. This is act, this is not an issue that has found its way yet into the pending main bills in the House and the Senate, but there it is being talked about a lot, and it is the subject of at least one side bill that was that's been introduced in the House. Um, and I, I want to start with Bob, and then Matt can also respond. What what can we do, or what should we do, and what shouldn't we do about the issue of venue abuse or forum shopping? Um, by particularly by by uh, by patent assertion entities. We'll start with you, Bob. Well, I, I'm I'm not sure how many of my uh, constituents here uh, would agree with it, so I'm going to just give you my own point of view on this. Um, until 1990, uh, for a patent owner to bring a lawsuit, it could be in one of two districts, where the defendant had its had its headquarters or where the defendant had a regular and established place of business and acts of infringement had occurred. And the Supreme Court had held that that was exclusive venue, uh, despite the wording of Section 1400 of Title 28. Uh, in 1990, the Federal Circuit uh, made a determination that where a corporation resides is anywhere it can be found. And that was what launched uh, uh, essentially countrywide, nationwide jurisdiction uh, against corporations in patent cases. And that gave rise to a district in, in the Eastern District of Texas, gave rise to a cottage industry in patent litigation. A very substantial number of patent cases are filed in the Eastern District of Texas. They have a very friendly, a very friendly plaintiff's bar there. They have a very friendly collection of jurors that understand that this is the primary industry of that part of Texas. And as a result, plaintiffs win a lot of the cases uh, in the Eastern District of Texas. And, and, and uh, the proposal that is in the manager's amendment to the House bill would uh, not return us to Section 1400, where uh, it was uh, 25 years ago, but would actually uh, limit the, the number of districts, but, but with a good deal of flexibility. And I think, that, I think that venue proposal, if modified in some ways to make it, make it clear that, that innovators can sue in the district where they're conducting innovation, uh, even if they've transferred the patents to an entity that they're part of, uh, I, I think that bill probably provides a workable, uh, a workable change to the venue laws that would be desirable. Thanks, Bob. Matt? Uh, well, wow. So I basically agree with Bob. It's, uh, <laughs> that's that's, I mean, twi that's yeah, twice yeah, in one know, day, right? I know. No, you know, I think he's pointed out the basic issue here, which is that we have one district uh, which is engaging really in forum selling, right? They've deliberately tailored their rules to make themselves very attractive to patent assertion entities speeding cases along in a way to run up cases, the costs of cases very quickly, uh, front-loading discovery as quickly as possible, again, to run up costs, giving uh, plaintiffs a lot more leverage uh, than they would have in other districts. And, you know, I think the basic idea of the venue proposal that's in the House bill, uh, I think the only place I disagree is that it was actually not in the manager's amendment, it was offered as an amendment to that later, but okay. whatever. Um, the, you know, the basic idea is that people should be able to bring the cases where the, the accused infringer is, where they, you know, where they're incorporated, where they actually have a principal place of business, and then, then add some a little more flexibility beyond the original 1400 um, to get at to. I think there's an attempt to let innovators sue where they've actually done the innovation. Maybe the language needs to be tweaked, but I think they've certainly tried to do that. Uh, I mean, I've spoken with staff, and that was their intent. Whether they've succeeded or not is another issue. It does need to be tweaked, but not by much. Yeah. So. You know, clearly there's a need to avoid having one district in 
Texas that has, well, a pretty small population relative to um, other districts having something like a fifth to a quarter of patent litigation cases, and almost all of them are patent assertion entities filing there. There's clearly something wrong with that. Uh, there's a great story in the New York Times from 2006 that is just as true today as when they wrote it, describing the actual industry there and how profitable it is for that area. And that's, that's not the purpose of patent litigation. Does anyone want to take a different viewpoint? Anyone want to disagree and say we should keep, uh, keep the Eastern District of Texas as is? for the people of the Eastern District of Texas? I'm sure they're very <laughs> nice people. Not, not to mess with the Eastern District of Texas. Well, that's a big challenge you've <laughs> thrown my way here. Um, I, uh, I agree in, in part, and the reason I agree is because I think what's happening in the Eastern District of Texas is more an issue of judge shopping than forum shopping. The nature and the way that they assign cases is that depending on the courthouse that you go to, the, the default is that the cases get assigned to the judge at that courthouse. And there are very few judges because there are several courthouses and not, not too many judges. And I don't think that the proper place in any legal system is for a plaintiff to be able to choose the judge who's going to hear their case. And Judge Gilstrap, as I understand, has something like 1,200 or 1,300 cases patent cases, when the average, if you were to divide the cases across all the judges, all the patent cases by all the judges is certainly well under 50. So I do think that there is an issue there. And I would assume that the plaintiffs are choosing to file where they're filing because they think that Judge Gilstrap is somebody that they want to have hear their cases. It doesn't necessarily mean that they think that the the Substantive outcomes will be more favorable, but unfortunately, the latest statistics, although it was not the case for a long time, the latest statistics would suggest that some judges, and this is across the country, some judges decide much more for patent owners and some judges much more against patent owners. So that's probably the variation. But normally, in most places, when you file a lawsuit, you can't pick which judge you're going to get. So you get the luck of the draw. You might get a judge who tends to rule more one way or than the other, and that's true of all litigation. So in that respect, I agree, and I agree that the major problem with venue is that people who have invented and or invested in the development of technology and or have their evidence and witnesses located where they're doing business want to be able to access their local courts for a lot of very good reasons. Among them, so that their witnesses will be within the subpoena power of the court, so that they can show up in time for trial, they can present them live rather than dryly by videotape, that they'll be there for rebuttal. There are lots of reasons why plaintiffs have a, a good reason to want to be able to sue in their home jurisdictions. But it sounds like there's some agreement that that could be accommodated. The bill as it sits now is nowhere near the bill that it was back in 19, or 2006, which was much more liberal towards allowing that. And hopefully if it moved that way, we'd see where we end up. Thanks, Phil. Just, just very briefly, uh, I, I'm from Southeast Texas, and yet I'm in wild agreement with everybody about the need for venue reform. That's a statement against interest, so uh, we'll count that. Oh, it should be admissible. <laughs> um, all right, let's, uh, in the interest of time, I, I want to just briefly return to IPR, even though, Phil, I just gave you your own rebuttal on a different issue. But, but let, me, let me start with Paul um, just briefly. Do you think it's appropriate for the, the IPR provisions on broadest reasonable interpretation and, and the burden of proof of, of um, a preponderance of the evidence to change those, to bring them into line with with district court, number one. Number two, if that isn't going to happen, do you think it's appropriate to exempt biotech pharma patents altogether from the IPR regime? So let, let me hear from you, Paul, then if someone wants to take a contrary opinion. Yes, yes. <laughs> Maybe elaborate in about 30 <laughs> okay. seconds, if you don't mind. So, so do me a favor and just Hit me with the first question again. Okay. So should should we change the standards to bring? Yes. Them why should the standards be lower for IPR and different for uh, circuit courts and and allow an imbalance 
that, that shouldn't be that way. So that would be one solution to the issue. Okay. And what about and, a carve out? Yeah. A carve out would be, would be excellent. And um, I think what, what a lot of folks don't realize is when, as we're developing drugs through every stage of development, uh, while another innovator is potentially coming up with a, another technology, which could infringe our technology, while they're in development, we can't touch them. And then once our drug gets approved uh, and um, the, the drug is on the market, a generic company or another innovator company has four years to continue to play around with the drug before they utilize paragraph four and file um, a petition against us. And then and only then can we defend ourselves. So there's a period of, could be eight years, could be 12 years, where an infringer is playing around in our field and we have no defense. So yes, carving that out um, would, be, would make perfect sense. And who wants to uh, take the flip side of that, anyone? Mike? I'll, I'll take it a little tiny bit, because, uh, uh, the, but, but only a little bit. I think that uh, in practical terms, uh, uh, you know, we have a patent system that covers a wide range of technologies, all of which have their own development costs, but the, they, they vary from industry to industry. And, uh, you know, the software industry doesn't have to pass FDA approval ever. Uh, and, and, and so the diff there are different hurdles in different industries. Um, uh, as a practical matter, uh, even regardless of whether you agree that the standards uh, uh, for patent uh, uh, litigation ought to, and, and for substantive patent approval ought to be the same, or for post-grant review ought to be the same for all industries, the fact is that the consensus, and it's a bipartisan consensus uh, in both houses, has, has been uh, that some sort of litigation reform needs to happen. Uh, and one effort to make sure that it happens is to is, has been to listen to what uh, 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 the, the biologics and pharmaceutical industries have said about the differences that they have to face. And if that is the uh, if that is part of the negotiation that ultimately leads to overall patent reform, I think a lot of uh, lawmakers are going to accept it. And, oh, well, I just want to finish Mike's answer. Please. Oh, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> um, so let me deal with the standard first. There's a very good reason why you use a different standard for IPR. Uh, it's a different procedure before different people. Judges in district court um, are supposed to defer to the expertise of the agency. That Supreme Court said that way back in the early 1800s. They've said it ever since. That's why we have the clear and convincing standard, because judges, generalists, are really not in a position where we want them just easily second-guessing the patent office. The patent office, on the other hand, should be able to second guess itself. They're the experts who actually make these decisions. The judges on the PTAB are, in fact, the ones who review decisions of examiners in the first instance if uh, an applicant appeals an examiner's rejection. Same people. They're the experts. And in fact, if you ask the PTAB how they staff cases, they make an effort. They have three judges in part because they want to make sure that at least one of those judges is a technical expert in the relevant area. Now, of course, that's not going to happen in district court, but it does happen in IPR, which is why we don't need to go changing the standard. The fact is the PTAB judges are doing a, a very good job. As far as the claim construction standard goes, BRI is working fine. Frankly, everybody I've talked to and heard from on the PTAB says, if you change it to the district court standard, nothing's really going to change. So if it makes you feel better, knock yourself out. But you know, changing the standard of proof is just silly. It's hardly... Um, it's a, a giant gift to patent owners that's completely unnecessary. Again, no one has pointed to a decision that the PTAB has, done, has made that's outrageous or just wrong. They've done a good job. Uh, feel free to prove me wrong, but nobody's pointed to a bad decision yet. So, uh, Paul, did you want to just get in one last word? Because I want to have one more question. Or It's early. People settle. There's a slight conflict of interest on the PTAB side. They get paid a fee to do these cases. They're building a beautiful, large staff. My sister happens to be a patent appellate judge, by the way. This is an interesting dinner conversation we have all the time. It's another statement against interest. There we go. <laughs> Does so, she get the fees? <laughs> no, she, she's not one. She's not an IPR judge. But it's, uh, yeah. It... Okay. I, I just want, we're, we're over time, actually. I want to have just one, one last question. We'll do a sort of a speed round. Um, we'll start with Bob and work our way around the table. It, my question is, what new 
types of ideas that haven't been proposed would you suggest, um, or, or things that have come and fallen by the wayside over the time, to advance and improve our, our patent system? In other words, imagine that none of this had happened, none of the lead up in the last few years that hasn't actually gotten us to, uh, to come to fruition had happened. What would you do sort of from the ground up? What would be one thing that you would do to improve the patent system? So if you can do that in about 30 seconds each, that would be great. I've, I've suggested to some people that, that they might take a, chat, a page from the American Arbitration Association and adopt something that resembles a program that was also initiated in the Northern District of California. And that's um, something called early neutral evaluation which assign, assigns uh, a, a, an, an expert or a, 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 something similar to a special master to make an assessment of the case and advise both parties on, on what the, uh, this expert's prospects, uh, or th uh, of this expert's view as to their prospects for, for uh, winning and, and, and value so that they've got a better framework in which to evaluate. People go into patent litigation with huge amounts of uncertainty. You don't know what prior art's going to surface. You don't know what the damage arguments are going to turn out to be. And, and if you could narrow that, uh, the uncertainty at the outset of a case, a lot more cases would settle. And certainly, the discovery and the cost of litigation would get more focused. Thanks. All right. Again, I, th I think it's important for people to keep in mind that regardless of whether this legislation passes, there has been a tremendous amount of change that's been taking place in the system. Of course, the American Events Act passed in 2011. There's been um, an unprecedented number of Supreme Court cases that have been making very significant changes to different uh, standards uh, under patent law, the vast majority of which have uh, I think arguably benefited users of patented technology. The, the uh, Judicial Conference, which is the rulemaking body, body for the federal judiciary, has just uh, approved new pleading standards, um, made recommendations on discovery. So I, 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 I want to sort of dispel any sort of misperception that, you know, if this legislation doesn't move, the, this, the system as a whole will, you know, remain in this sort of static state. That's not the case at all. Uh, but in terms of what you know, we think would be constructive change, um, there's a, a, a bill that came out on the Senate side as sort of an alternative to um, the, the, Pat the Patents Act called the Strong Patents Act, uh, introduced by Senator Coons and Durbin and others, that includes a combination of what we consider to be balanced um, demand letter uh, legislation that would give the FTC um, greater guidance to use its consumer protection authority to go against some of these really egregious uh, situations involving mass mailing of demand letters. It includes some targeted uh, interparties review changes that we think would make the system work better for everyone because you know we recognize that right now the bio and pharma companies are really you know at the tip of the spear in terms of the abuse that's taking place but we we want to make sure that the IPR provisions work well for all um, industries and patent owners and then uh, a permanent end to USPTO fee diversion which has been a long standing goal for um, for uh, patent stakeholders so those are the kinds of you know i think targeted constructive changes that would, um, I think, benefit the system as a whole. Thanks, Lori. Matt? Uh, well, so I'm going to uh, go sort of way out of the box here. The, honestly, speaking for myself, uh, I think a big part of the problem is that we allow monetization of patents in the first place. So uh, if we were starting over, I think we would have something more like a domestic industry requirement as we have at the ITC for suing. Essentially, either you're the inventor and you've invested a lot of money in the research, you actually make a product that uses it, somehow you have some skin in the game, not just you bought the patent and now you want to make money off of it, because that is really our biggest problem right at the moment. There are plenty of improvements we can make at the patent office. Um, the Strong Act is a nightmare, which I don't have time to get into. Go to patentprogress.org to read more. Uh, I think that's my brief answer. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Bill? Brevity is the soul of wit, by the way. Okay. With the exception of the comment I'm about to make and the judge shopping comment, my comments have been on behalf of the Coalition for 21st Century Patent Reform. 
my judge shopping comment and the following are my own observations. Duly uh, noted. Um, I think that clarification of the patentability of certain subject matters, especially in the biopharmaceutical space, and particularly in the area of diagnostics, is absolutely critical to the health and well-being of our population going forward. I see too many instances now where uncertainty about whether something is patentable subject matter is discouraging people from investing money into personalized medicine and other areas that stand the best prospect, not only for providing effective therapies, but also for substantially reducing the cost of care by being sure that the drug that's going to be given to someone is the best one to work with that person's DNA. So if I were going to be able to change one thing about the patent system, that's what I'd change. Thanks. Paul? Those who sue must have a commercial interest in the technology that they're challenging, very similar to what Matt said. Carve-outs for the bio and pharma industry on the Hatch-Watchman Act, which was a procedure that was put in place uh, in order to overcome some of these issues and equalize the standards between IPR and circuit courts. All right, Mike, last word. Well, uh, brevity is the soul of wit, but the person saying that is Polonius in Hamlet. <laughs> Take that how you will. The, the, I, I, I agree with Bob's uh, suggestion about uh, a proposal, you know, proposing an early neutral evaluation. I think that's good. Uh, I think that uh, the, strong, uh, the Strong Act and the Troll Act uh, are, are actually bad suggestions that address the issue as if it were primarily about demand letters, which is, in my view, not. It's really about uh, a more, more uh, deep-running procedural issues. I think that the one thing that I would suggest that might improve the patent process would be uh, figure out how to fund the patent office so that they do good patent uh, claim review in the first place. I think that one of the things that we know, certainly patent uh, prosecutors know, is that uh, the PTO is, uh, is, does not match the task before it. The PTO does not have the resources adequately to, to do the work that it does. Thank you very much. How about a big round of applause for our panelists? We, uh, we really appreciate your taking time out of your busy schedules to come and entertain the rest of us. So thank you uh, for your very informative contributions. Thank you to the AEI staff, in particular, Evelyn Smith and Emily Rapp for making this event happen. And thank you all for coming. Please uh, make sure you follow us at AEI Tech uh, on Twitter and look for all of our publications. See you in about nine, 10 months. <laughs>